Thank you, Linda. Uh, welcome, everyone. I have a very fancy title for the presentation, but uh, effectively, I'll be talking about just mobile publishing in our industry. And I would like to show you how you can do so using uh, Adobe Robo Help 11. So before I begin, just a little bit of introduction about myself. Uh, my name is Vikram Verma. I work as a product manager at Adobe for uh, Adobe TechCom products, which include RoboHelp, FrameMaker, and TCS. And I'm responsible for product strategy, roadmap, customer relationship, and partner ecosystem. And uh, so that's uh, a quick bit about myself. And so essentially, I, I wanted to cover these three things today. So one is, uh, what are the key mobile publishing trends in the tech comm industry today? And uh, what are the challenges and solutions if you want to adopt mobile publishing? And finally, how you can do so in Rodovi RoboHelp 11. And since we have a small group, so I can uh, you know, really customize this presentation. So if you want to me to focus on, let's say, the trends more, I can go a little bit deeper into that. If you want me to focus on the demo, I can go deeper into that. So, so just stop me anytime if you want to go deeper, and I can, I can do that. That's OK. So let's uh, get started. Uh, so way back in uh, Jan 2007, uh, as all of us know that Apple invented iPhone, which uh, really uh, revolutionized the mobile industry. And uh, seven and a half years later, we have more than a billion smartphones in the world, which means that 16% of the population now have smartphone. And if you look at uh, the developed countries, so I have some data about the European countries, uh, the mobile adoption, the mobile penetration is more than 50% in most of them. And this data is a little dated, so it was last year's data. So I, I, I assume that uh, the mobile penetration would have gone even higher by now as we speak. So mobile has become a sort of uh, a core part of our lives, and we use it uh, every day for a variety of tasks, including mobile, including internet surfing, consuming content, and whatnot. Right? And there is another data which is very interesting, which is uh, that you see the blue line, which is the number of desktop internet users, and the yellow line is uh, the number of mobile internet users. So uh, we see that currently the number of uh, users who are accessing the internet on the mobile phone have actually surpassed uh, the, those who are using, who are surfing the internet on desktop. And the whole content consumption itself is changing because people are using their mobile phones, smartphones, tablets to consume the content, be it reading news, be it you know, checking their emails or whatnot. And especially learning content, you know, e-learning and m-learning are also on the rise. So what we wanted to understand was like, you know, and because of all this, uh, a lot of industries are aggressively pursuing their mobile strategy. In fact, some of them have mobile first strategy where they think about, you know, how they should uh, compete in the mobile space. And techcom is no different. So we wanted to understand how is techcom doing as far as mobile publishing is uh, concerned. So before I show you some, some data from techcom industry, I just wanted to ask you, how many of you are doing mobile publishing right now? OK, just one. I think we have ideal sort of audience for this presentation. OK, so we're going to talk about something really interesting. So the first thing is, uh, so Adobe does uh, survey of tech comm professionals every year. So we do have an annual survey. And in fact, we will be launching this year's survey in September itself, where we ask uh, the professionals a number of things. And uh, mobile publishing is one of that. So if you look at the last three years, in 2012, only 15% of the organizations were doing mobile publishing. And that number in 2013, which is the actual number, grew to 37%, and which is like 150% growth in one year. This is by far the fastest growth we have seen in any trend in tech comm within one year, even faster than structured authoring adoption. And uh, the other question that we had on the survey was, you know, how many of you or how many of the organization would actually plan to publish to mobile phone in future? So this 37% are currently doing. And the good news is that in future, two years, three years, we don't know yet. But in future, this number is going to go up by to 55%, which is another, if you look at that, which is another 50% growth from the current level. So we can clearly see that mobile publishing is no longer a new trend in techcom. It has achieved a critical mass, and most of the organization, majority of the organizations are either doing it or they want to do it, and uh, that's going to drive higher user engagement, more readership of the content, 
and finally a happy, satisfied consumers who will be consuming your content. And there was one interesting uh, uh, article which Forbes published recently, which was that 50% of, I think 50 or 60, I just forgot the number, but 50 or 60% of the customers uh, read the documentation before they make a purchase decision. So documentation is very, very critical. And if consumers are doing research on their smartphones or tablets, it becomes really, really important for everyone to publish their content for mobile phones. We also, because we had a lot of data, you know, with variety of information, we also wanted to see whether this specific trend is concentrated in some areas. And what we found was that North America, 38% of the organizations are doing mobile publishing in EMEA, which is Europe, and Middle East, uh, the, the, the adoption of mobile publishing was relatively less. It was actually uh, the lowest as compared to the regions are concerned at 31%. And APJ, the Asia Pacific in Japan, is actually leading uh, the space with 41% mobile publishing adoption as of now. But what we see all in all is that uh, mobile publishing is happening everywhere. It's not just concentrated to a specific geo. It's happening everywhere. It's just that you know some regions are behind the curve, and some regions are leading the mobile adoption curve. If you look at uh, the mobile publishing adoption by the size of the organization, so that was another interesting bit that we wanted to understand, whether it's the bigger companies or the smaller companies, who is doing mobile publishing? So what we found was uh, very interesting, that the smaller companies are actually ahead in terms of adoption of mobile publishing. And the reason could be, there could be many reasons. The thing is that, for example, tiny companies, smaller companies are always more swift in terms of taking action while responding to new trends. The bigger companies have complex content. They might have acquired a number of companies, so they have legacy content, which is complex. They have longer evaluation cycle. And they also cannot change their workflow very easily as compared to smaller companies. So that's why they are a little behind in terms of adoption as of now. But the good thing is, that in future, if we, if we want to talk about you know, how it's going to look like in future, uh, the bigger companies, there is a lot of room to grow. Because we see that, for example, enterprises, 29% to 55% will happen in future. Whereas if you talk about tiny companies, it's 62% to 69%. So tiny companies have sort of reached their peak adoption. And uh, by the way, tiny companies represent a lot of professional services companies who are writing the content for their clients and because their clients might need to publish on mobile phones, so that's why they are adopting it. So, just a sec. Then we also wanted to understand, you know, what about the industries? Are there specific industries uh, which are leading this adoption, mobile publishing adoption? So we looked at various, you know, industries uh, uh, from the data that we had, and we found that some of the industries, which are, for example, professional services, high tech and telecommunication are leading the mobile publishing adoption with roughly 40% uh, adoption as of now. And uh, the industries such as financial services, manufacturing, and healthcare are lagging behind. And which is again understandable because healthcare, for example, if you talk about healthcare, it's a highly regulated industry. Uh, it's not so easy to change your workflows. You need to get approvals, and that takes time. Similarly for manufacturing, uh, mostly they have been creating user manuals, so it, it takes time for them to you know, change uh, their workflow and get the approvals, necessary approvals. Here also we see that even though uh, these industries are lagging behind, the room for growth is really high in these industries. So they are thinking about it, it's just the contemplation which is going on, and sooner or later the laggards will also adopt mobile publishing. So while looking at, you know, from all these angles, from geo, from industry, from size of the organizations, what we found was that mobile publishing is a core trend now. Whether they are doing it or they plan to do, but in a steady state, we expect 50 to 60% organizations, no matter what their uh, profile is, whether they are smaller companies, whether they are from Japan or UK, and which industry they belong to, they will be doing mobile publishing. And there are a variety of use cases, and these are some of the use cases that we have seen uh, while talking to uh, actual customers. For example, in healthcare, doctors are using, uh, doctors and medical staff are using the content on, uh, reading the content on their tablet devices, smartphone devices. They are also maintaining 
you know, some of the some of the doctors are also maintaining medical records as well, even though it doesn't fall in, in the tech comm category as such. Uh, some of the airlines have started giving, uh, instead of you know, giving a printed manual to the pilots, they have started giving the content on a tablet, which is much more easy for the pilots to, you know, uh, from, a, from an efficiency point of view. And we've also seen uh, that some of the technicians who are you know, working either in a plant or who are, for example, wind turbine technicians who are working on the field, so they are also using the content on either tablet or smartphones. And, uh, and a lot of companies are trying to experiment with this and they are monitoring and trying to figure out you know, what is the kind of productivity enhancements uh, that they can get. And uh, the initial pilots have been very successful. And uh, some of the companies, especially in airline industry uh, and uh, uh, energy industry, they have uh, plans to incorporate it on a larger scale. And there are you know, many, many other use cases. For example, even uh, the field, let's say, sales agent or field customer service agents will also need to have content which they want to access. I mean, nobody is going to you know, pull out a laptop and open it and connect to the internet. Mobile phone is always there, always connected to the internet. So they would just, whenever they need the information, they would want to access it then, then and there. So I think uh, I'm a, you know, I hope I presented with you some of the interesting insights uh, that we got from the survey. And uh, you know, a lot of majority of the companies are thinking about it, and it's the right time. If you don't think about mobile publishing, uh, then probably you will be left behind in terms of you know competing with your competitors. So uh, if mobile publishing is important, then you know, how to do it? So what are the challenges, how you can solve them, and what are the tools which you can use to do it? So let's talk about the challenges first. So the, the biggest challenge is that if you are using legacy output formats, uh, that's not going, going to make the cut as far as mobile publishing is concerned. So instead of legacy output formats such as PDF, Web Help, CHM, you need to think about the newer output formats be it ebooks, HTML5, mobile apps. So these are the new formats that you have to think about. And I'm going to talk about you know, what are the issues, why you have to change to these newer output formats. So let's, let's talk about, you know, uh, for this presentation, what I'm going to do is uh, I will be talking about web help vis a vis HTML5. So let's take that case, that scenario, and try to understand what are the issues. So the biggest issue is that the traditional HTML sites uh, don't scale well on mobile devices. So I tried this uh, website, which is the Sony support website. Sony is a big company. You know, they must be managing their content pretty well. But when I typed it uh, on my Galaxy device, which has a, you know, a fairly big screen, uh, this is how I see the content. And there are various issues with that. Uh, let's talk about some of these issues. The biggest issue is that it's very difficult to read. It's not optimized for mobile phone. And because it was optimized, it was designed for a desktop or a laptop, a bigger screen. What happens is that the mobile browser will actually zoom out try, while trying to fit the content on the smaller screen. And that's why it becomes very difficult to read. The other issue is it's touch unfriendly. I mean, on, on, on a smartphone or a tablet, people will not be using the mouse to pinpoint exactly where they want to go, right? They will be using their fingers and the icons and the links which you want to show. They should be big enough, large enough, so that the users can easily navigate to the content. But you know, you can get away with these issues if you zoom in. You know, you can always zoom in and get everything bigger. But then the navigation becomes a problem because you will have a vertical scroll bar as well as a horizontal scroll bar. You will not know like where you are in the scheme of things. A human, uh, human mind can only, at one time, can only process just one scroll bar, either the vertical one or the horizontal one. If you have scroll bars on both sides, you will not be able to process. So it's difficult to navigate. And the last one is, and it's not the most important one, but it's, it's critical enough that, see, this website was created for a lot of research, right? Somebody comes here on a desktop, spend some time, and figure out you know, where, are, where they can go into. But all this is not necessary for a mobile user. They want to get the information as quickly as possible, and they want to get to the relevant information. 
And if you look at that, uh, if you look at the internet connection on mobile phone, that is typically slower than a broadband connection. So the loading time will also be a little slower on a mobile phone, and by that time, the, the user might be frustrated even before he has seen the content. So these are the four issues which are like you have to definitely solve. Otherwise, you will not be able to engage your end users. So these are like the hygiene things need to be done. Uh, the other things can be done later, but these are the things which we can, we have to address. So what's the, what's the solution, how we can do that? So one, uh, one way to give a good mobile experience is by creating a website with a responsive design approach. How many of you know about responsive design? Okay, so I think 50% uh, know about responsive design. I'm just gonna quickly touch upon what it is. So basically it's just one content and it can adapt to a desktop, tablet, mobile, or any, any screen size. And how it does is, behind the scene there is HTML5, CSS3, and then there are three core components which are there. So the first is, uh, it has flexible grids. So on any website, whenever you want to show the content, you generally create a grid. And that grid in traditional websites is very fixed. So it cannot change the width or the height. And that's why it cannot adapt to different screen sizes. Whereas in uh, responsive design, those grids can adapt. For example, if let's say the width of the screen is small, so the, the, the grid will change, reduce the width, but it will increase the height of the grid so that you know, the users can see it, scroll and see the content. Similarly, it has flexible images. So instead of a fixed size image, the images can be resized depending on the screen size. And finally, uh, there are media queries. So media queries help you to define uh, that which content can be hidden for which devices. And that is very, 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 very critical because you just want to show the content which is relevant to the mobile user as compared to showing everything. So by doing these three things, what you do is you, uh, you solve the four problems that we talked about, uh, which is readability, uh, navigation, easy navigation, touch friendliness, and uh, f the faster loading time might not be uh, solved by this because uh, the media queries will only hide when everything is loaded in the browser. So whatever content you have, it will load. So uh, the only that, that is the only thing which cannot be solved by responsive design. Everything else can be solved. But let's talk, and you know, there are multiple responsive websites. Responsive design is, you know, again, one of the, the keyword which is uh, there, uh, out there in the internet uh, circles, and a lot of websites are using this to create uh, you know, newer websites. So, and these are some of them, I have listed some of them. Adobe and HTML is one, CSS tricks. If you, if you read Mashable, you can see how the experience is because that's also responsive design based. And similarly, Time Magazine is also another website which is based on responsive design. Okay, so, but there are other issues as well. It's not just readability and those things that I talked about. Uh, the other issues, let's talk about that. The, the big issue is that the attention spans are crashing. So in good old times, probably a small TV used to unite the entire family, right? And even in India, countries like India, even the neighborhoods, because the neighbors used to come to see the TV. Uh, but now things have changed. You have TV you know, in, in different rooms, people are watching TV separately. While they're watching TV, they're also working on the laptop, checking Facebook on the mobile phones. There are a lot of distractions. You don't read a, a good novel or a book nowadays. You just watch a two minutes YouTube video. You don't write a lengthy email, you just tweet, right? So, so attention spans are very short. If you don't engage the users quickly, the chances are you will lose uh, uh, your end users. And I just wanna show you a few, uh, few uh, numbers as well. So Google did one study uh, where they, uh, where they did a study of like, what is the average interaction time per device? And what they found was the smaller the device, the smaller is the interaction time. For example, on a TV, average interaction time is 43 minutes, but on a smartphone, it is just 17 minutes, which means that you know, you're very fidgety when you're using a smartphone. And uh, if you talk about user behavior, who are you know, people who are consuming content on smartphones, 
uh, what they found was that mobile users are five times more likely to abandon the task if the site isn't optimized for mobile. So if a user is coming, let's say, coming to a website on a desktop, he will try to find the information. But if he's coming through a mobile phone, if he doesn't find the information quickly enough, then he will probably abandon the task. So it's very, very critical to engage them. You just you know, uh, have them hooked on your website as soon as possible. And then there's this another trend. So I'm just sort of creating a story over here. So basically this is, so if uh, you have a smartphone, and let's say the, you want to figure out what is the proportion of internet surfing that you do on mobile phone. So what is happening is that the smartphone users are doing the internet surfing more and more on mobile phone. So if you have a smartphone, you will not use your desktop. You will just you know, browse on, 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 on your smartphone. So what this means is that even your existing users, because you smartphone penetration is growing, right? So you can't control it. So even your existing users will have smartphone or already have smartphone. They will try to access your content on their smartphones. If it is not optimized, they will go away. So your readership will go down, which is bad for business. So that's one thing which you have to take into account. So what you need to do is, so what needed to be done is uh, that you need to create adaptive content, you know, different content for different devices so that you can hook the customers wherever they are accessing the content from. And there are various ways of achieving that. One is, and it's the most popular conventional approach, that you have a separate mobile website. So if we talk about Google, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, they have a separate mobile website. So if you type Twitter uh, on your mobile phone, you will be taken to mobile.twitter.com or m.twitter.com. And, uh, and they have to cater to uh, these smartphone users because their business depends on them, right? So based on the, the number of users who are accessing their website, their, rev their revenue is directly proportional to that. So if they don't uh, really optimize the experience for mobile, uh, they will lag behind in terms of business. And then there is another way. The other way which is very popular for smartphone is that uh, you create a mobile app. That's, that's another, and it has several advantages. For example, the content could be offline uh, and you can create a stickiness. So for example, if you talk about, let's say, mobile commerce company, at least in India, what we see is that there are a bunch of mobile commerce company and what they want to do is they will give special offer discounts and whatnot if, they, if you install their mobile app. Because they know once you have the mobile app, you will be a sticky customer. Because that is also a pain that you go to the browser, type in the, you know, the address. Instead of that, you just launch a mobile app. So that is another way of uh, offering your content and keeping your users hooked. And there are, you know, the, the apps are very popular. There are more than 750K plus apps in iOS and Android store, and even the Windows, in, in the Windows store as well, the number of apps are growing. Okay, so we talked about responsive, we talked about adaptive content, but I want to introduce one more problem or one more challenge, which is uh, the device fragmentation. So we have a three inch smartphone, we have a four inch smartphone, the old Apple uh, phone, and we have 4.7 inches, 5.5 inches, then seven inch tablet, 8.7 inches, iPad mini, 10 inches, the usual tablet. So even let's say you say that, hey, I want to have my different content for different devices, but how many different content would you create? How would you satisfy these device fragmentation, different screen sizes? Thankfully, there is a solution for that as well. Uh, because there has been a lot of research on how you can optimize the user experience for this kind of scenario, which is called RESS, or you can say it responsive web design with the server side component. So let me explain what it is. So basically what you do is, uh, you say that, hey, uh, what I want to do is, I want to create one experience for all smartphone users uh, from let's say three inches to five inches screen size. No matter what is the size of the screen for them, I want to have one specific uh, content and one specific look and feel. Similarly, I want to have one specific look and feel for let's say all the devices from five inches to 10 inches and then a different look and feel and content for the rest of the devices. 
So what you do is uh, you create these device categories, which I talked about. And for each of these device categories, you, you know, specify you know, what should be the branding, the layout, CSS, etc., so that you optimize the, the hygiene and look and feel. And then finally, you also, for these device categories, you say that, hey, what should be my content? So once you do that, and then once, so basically for each device category, you generate different content. All of them have responsive web design because within a category, the device sizes will vary. So you really want to have responsive web design so that the content can adapt. And then finally, you have a server side component or a JavaScript so that when you land on a page, it can tell you that, hey, which kind of device you are coming from and then redirect you to the relevant content. So that's, that's one way to solve all these problems. You will, have, you will solve the responsive design problems by readability and everything by responsive design. You will solve adaptive content, and you will also solve the device fragmentation issue. So you'll, you'll be able to solve almost everything with RESs. And there are some examples of RESs are CNN, SlideShare, WordPress, eHow, and a number of new websites are also adopting this RESs. Okay, so very quickly, I just want to compare these four approaches that we talked about, responsive, website, uh, app, and RESS solution. So if you talk about mobile users need, uh, I would say the app is the best one. For example, the use cases which you talked about, let's say the pilots, right, and the technicians. So it will be great if you can just create an app with all the content which they need to use, and the pilots will just install an app and they can just see the content offline. All they have to do is just launch the app, right? So that's the best mobile user need. This is useful when you know exactly who your end user is going to be, and you know that they will definitely download your app. And the second thing is, uh, yeah, so mobile website and RESS are good because there also you can have different content. And responsive is okay, it's, it's not the best because there you just solve the hygiene issues. You don't have different content for different devices. In terms of ease of maintenance, responsive is the easiest to maintain because you just have one content, one CSS. All you need to do is just transform your content to a responsive website. Whereas for other solutions, you will need to have maintained different version of the content, different CSS, look and feel, et cetera, et cetera. And then in terms of SEO friendliness, uh, both RESs and responsive are good because they are just one URL, whereas mobile website, because of the two URLs, it might be a little lower than the responsive design. Apps, uh, till now, apps have not been very searchable as such. You can't use Google search and being taken to a mobile app. So from a search perspective, app are not the best. So that's why I'm saying you, if you know the end users, then only you should think about app, otherwise not. And then in terms of loading time and performance, uh, the best is app because it's native, right? And uh, the worst in this, uh, in this category is responsive. And the reason is because it will lo load everything. And once it loads everything, then only the media queries will hide certain content. So that's why it is the worst. So these are like various parameters. You can also devise your own parameters to see uh, which output formats you should think about. So uh, I have created a very you know, small framework uh, like which approach you should take. For example, the first thing that you should look for is like what is your goal? And if your goal is to uh, make the legacy content mobile friendly, then you should go for responsive design, period, because you don't want to manage it, and it, that's the only thing. If you want to optimize, however, if you want to optimize content and customer experience on mobile devices, then you can think about RESS, separate mobile site, and native app, and what you choose among these three will depend on a case-by-case -case basis. So you need to understand who is the end consumer. Is it uh, somebody professional who will depend on your, on your content, or it's just like a casual, or casual reader who will need the content you know, on a uh, uh, not very frequent basis? And then, uh, so those kind of things. So on a case-by-case -case basis, you need to evaluate and see you know, what is the best approach for you. So in RoboHelp, uh, we support all of these, so I will show you very quickly what we can do. But before that, uh, there was just one uh, data point which uh, I hadn't shared with you. Now, so basically, we also wanted to understand, you know, from a from a format perspective, what is the adoption of uh, various formats? 
So we looked at HTML5, EPUB, Kindle, and App, and we found that HTML5 is the dominant uh, uh, format as of now, 28% adoption, and Kindle is the least used format with 5% adoption as of now. And even in future, we see that HTML5 will continue to dominate because it's very, very easy to implement and manage. So 44% adoption in future. Uh, but EPUB and uh, mobile apps are going to grow by 100%, and they will also have like 24, 25% adoption in future. And the other thing that you will notice from this, uh, this stat is that uh, the growth of these individual mobile formats is actually faster or higher than the overall mobile publishing, which means that in future, organizations will adopt more than one output format for mobile because they want to cater to all these scenarios. Okay, so that's, that's all I wanted to cover from a theory perspective. Let me show you uh, the output from Adobe RoboHelp. So for that, what I have done is, uh, so I have this, uh, how many of you use RoboHelp, are familiar with RoboHelp? Okay, just a few. Okay, so it's basically, we have uh, a project. Let me show you the project. Uh, So it has various topics and you know everything. So what we want to do is, let's say we want to generate, the first thing that I introduced was a responsive HTML5, right? So you can generate responsive HTML5 by clicking uh, on this new SSL and just select a responsive HTML5 and then you can configure it. So let me show you how it can be configured. So if you go over here, and if people are using generating web help, it's very, very similar to web help. Everything is similar in the sense title bar. In the content, you specify which content you want in the output. In the, in the sense TOC, index, glossary, conditional build expressions. The only thing that you have to do is select the layout, which is the CSS, uh, which is used to display the output. And then uh, you can generate it. So I have already generated it. I'm uh, running out of time, so I'm just going to show you how the output looks like. So if you see the output, so this is how it looks like. This is the tablet output and because the resolution is small. So let me just uh, change the settings. Yeah. So once I make it, it's based on the resolution, whether it's you are coming from uh, the, the desktop, laptop, tablet, or mobile phone. So this is how it looks like on a, on a, on a laptop or a desktop. You also have these images, and uh, and then there is one image which we have of Peter Grinch, who is actually with us right now. So if you reduce the size of the browser, you will see that you know. Let's say this is the browser, this is the tablet version. So if people are accessing it on a tablet, this is how it's gonna look like. You can scroll the content, and this is like sort of an app-like behavior. So you can see the table of contents here. You go back, you can see anything. And this is the index. So let me go back to this. If you reduce the screen size even further, you will see that everything resizes, and then it become that. Then it comes in a mobile, uh, in a in a output which is suitable for mobile. So you can scroll down the content. Uh, these icons are locked, similarly, and you can browse using the browse sequence. You can see the the uh, the TOC by clicking on this icon. Similarly, you can see the index and glossary. So that's one way. So basically what I have done is I have just created a responsive HTML5 output from a project, and I can see how it's going to look like on various devices on different screen sizes. So I can test it immediately. But let's say you want to take it uh, one step forward, and you want to have a different content for different devices, right? So for example, if I go back here, so I have this topic, which is Equal Opportunities 2 and I have a table in there. So what I want to do is that I know that on mobile devices, tables are not usually a good thing to do, right? So what I have to do is 
for a mobile device, I want this information to be in bullets. And for a desktop device, a laptop device, I want it to be shown in, uh, let's say, tables, right? And that's what I want to do. So for, for that, what I did was I, I created the two content, similar content. One is in uh, heading and then uh, the content. And the other one is in the tables. And I have tagged it. So this is use tables tag. And the other one, I tagged it as use headings tag. Now what I do is, if I really want to do adaptive RESS kind of content, I need to create a multi-screen HTML5 output. And that is uh, this icon. Once again, I can just click on this and uh, create a multi-screen HTML5 icon. Once I go in there, So in multi-screen, what you can do is you can define that, hey, desktop is one category. So what is the content that you want to have for this category? Similarly, phone is another category, and tablet is another category. So what I have done is for phone, I have said that, hey, don't use tables. Use the headings instead. And for desktop, what I have done is use headings instead of don't use headings, just use tables. And then what I do is for each of these screen profiles, the like different kind of uh, devices which can be there, I have assigned a layout, a different CSS. In this case, I have assigned just one, I want the same CSS for all the different devices, but you can also have different CSS for different devices as well. And then I just publish it. So let me show you how the output looks like. So first of all, the output will be, so let me just show you how it will be created. So I'll just go over two minutes over. Is that okay with you guys? Okay. So you have this multi-screen HTML5 output. So what it has done is, for each of these device categories, it has created a separate content because you have defined the, the content to be different, right? And then what it does is for each, for example, if you go to desktop and let's say you click on index, and you look at uh, Equal Opportunities 2, you will see that you have the content in a table. But if you go back, let's say you go back, and you see the phone output, see the phone index, then what you do is you want to see Equal Opportunities 2, you see that there is no table. Instead, there is the content in, in bullet form. So that way you can, and it's just one of the example. Basically, you can do a lot of things. For example, you can use a, a big image for a desktop and use a very small image for a mobile phone because you want the loading time to be faster. You can hide certain content. The details can be hidden or could be in a progressive disclosure for mobile phone. So you can do all that thing. So that's how you deliver the RESS solution. If you want to deliver just the mobile help, let's say a different mobile website, what you can do is in the multi-screen, you already have the output for phone. So you just take that, that, that output and just uh, host it as a different website. So the separate mobile website also you can do. And finally, you can create an app as well. So what you can do is, you know, you go here and you click on generate a native mobile app, and then you just select the output which you want to use, and then there are certain SDKs which you will need to install on your, on your desktop, and once you install it, uh, it's very, very simple. You just click on generate, and uh, app will be generated. So, I, so Peter, who is uh, sitting with us, actually has uh, a help app which was generated using RoboHelp on his uh, mobile phone. So if you guys are interested, we will be at Adobe Booth. We can show you how the uh, native app looks like. And uh, you can also generate an ebook, so which is very, very similar to the same SSL that I showed uh, for HTML5. And then this also I have generated. And if you click on View, So you will see that, you know, hey, this is the ebook which you want to see. And uh, once again, what we can do is, so this is the image of uh, Peter. You might be reading it on a tablet. 
but let's say the, you are reading it on a smaller device, you will see that it's an ebook, but the images, tables, and text can just uh, adapt to the, the screen size. So in a way, uh, we talked about all the output formats, the challenges, and how we can solve them. With Ro Adobe RoboHelp 11, uh, you have the power of creating any sort of output. Uh, the choice is yours, what you want to choose. It depends on your case, your scenario. Uh, but from a tool perspective, we have everything covered. Uh, that's it from my side. So are there any questions which uh, you want me to answer? Yeah. 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 So you'll need to localize both, but it will have conditions on both, even the localized version, right? So that's why I said that RES is a little, from an ease of maintenance point of view, it's a little uh, down as compared to responsive, because you have two content. You just need to make sure that uh, single sourcing is efficient. Any other question? Okay, thank you. If you'd like to uh, see the demo in detail, then please uh, feel free to catch me at Adobe Booth, and I can go through uh, each of these output formats in detail and show you how it can be done. Thanks a lot for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Why is it all these fakers seem to make the morning papers? The selling records by the million seem so easy in my opinion. Look at the jazz star, you really need some guts. Playing from seven to midnight, surviving on peanuts. He's selling records by the dozen, probably sold his tenants to make him. With artwork designed by his brother And liner notes by his mother Told what to do, miming to a tape While a team of experts make sure you're looking great Taking a limo to your own private bar Oh my god, I want to be a pop star Going to get on the TV and go on dates with only the pretty Maybe next year I'll pretend to be gay I'll sell some more records in a flash that way Makes no difference if I look like a nut Every kid in the world is gonna copy my haircut I advertise some trainers, maybe even a car Shrewd product placement will guarantee I'm a star The godly guy will write my songs Surely there is nothing wrong Retiring when I'm 22 with a house of car nothing to do Instantaneous satisfaction then will be Got no need for artistic credibility With this attitude I'm pretty sure to go far Oh my god I want to be a pop star Maybe it's too easy Dee -dee -doo 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 To move so quick so far I want to be a pop star Where's the middle ground? It's hard to make a living with your own true sound What road am I going to tread? What the hell would I do instead? There may be no tours in Roma Or a drug-induced designer coma No teenage girls when show is over I prefer my women only